what's up? And welcome to another episode of Eevee's Review. So as you can see here, I'm playing Creatures 2 on my Genesis controller. That's a Genesis controller hooked up to the Commodore 64 via the Genesis adapter. Which plugs perfectly into the side of the machine. And so then I get C for regular fire, B is turbo fire, so if I do C, I can do one fire at a time. And if I do B, I can do turbo fire. So that sort of helps for killing these guys here. You still gotta get the timing just right. I'll tell you, this game is nigh impossible, but it's sure got amazing colors. If you look at the color fidelity, it really seems to have more than 16 colors, which is because I believe it does sort of an interlace type of thing where it will do multiple colors on the same line alternating every other frame. You just gotta see it. You've never seen anything like this on the Commodore 64 until 1992. So I can open this disk image with the, using the application extensions, I got the file browser attached to the D64 type. So if I do shift enter, then I can just browse to the file intro and just run it instantly. And the only thing you ever have to wait for is the decompression built into the program. So anyway, I wanted to update you on the chip tester progress, but I just can't stop staring at this screen. It's just mesmerizing. So for that reason, I'm just going to load up Castle Wolfenstein. That's better. Okay, so. Let me give you an update on the chip tester. I've got the latest prototype right here. So I turn it on. I've even got these cool settings for the brightness. No brightness. No brightness looks really good on camera. And then the contrast. High contrast. No contrast. Yeah, I'd say high contrast is good on camera too. So I've added a few tests since last time. I've added a test for the 555 timer. I've improved the test for the 74LS06, as well as quite a few other tests that have shorted pins. I had to make tests unique to specific boards. And the reason is, if you look at these pins here, you'll see that this one pin on each of these boards is shorted to VCC or five volts. So what that means is that that pin stays high all the time. And that's fine. That's a valid input for the gate. In this case, because it's an AND gate, anything AND1 is just itself. So it acts as a pass through or actually a slight delay. But anyway, that's a problem for my in-circuit tests because what happens is I detect for short circuits by sending a signal on one line and checking it on the other line. The problem is that for power, you can't use the pins on my microcontroller to drive power. Power gets wired in directly with these jumpers here. So what that means is that Pretty much all the power flowing through that pin is being partially sucked up by all the other chips in the system. So I don't think there's really any sensible way to detect a short circuit between that pin and other pins. And so that's why I have a custom version of the test that makes that assumption for you. Now there's very few tests that actually need a special case for a specific motherboard, and that is one of them. Most of the tests can detect short circuits automatically. I pretty much went over all my tests and improved all of them to have better short detection. 
and to really just test better overall. My RAM test I improved because I discovered that I was sending the chips some opposing signals. That happened because on the Commodore 64 it uses the same pin for input and output. So those pins are shorted together. So now I'm getting on the board in the last video that I got only passes on some of the chips in circuit, I'm getting pass on all of them in circuit. I've also revised the PLA test because what I was noticing is that in circuit, I wouldn't get quite the same results of out of circuit. So when I test the PLA loose, I get a very specific set of equations. When I test it in circuit, it seems that some of the edge cases can go either way, which is not a problem because it's still within the spec if you look at this chart. So what I've done is created a pass case where it says PLA okay, where if you're testing it in circuit, it'll tell you that it's past the most basic equations. Even if all 65,000 combinations of input pins don't yield the expected results. I've also improved the CPU test. In the last video I said the address tends to roam to the reset address. When you're testing it in circuit, it will eventually reset itself, probably because it gets some invalid instructions and that triggers an interrupt. But it's a pretty reliable case where after about 12 or 13 instructions, it always ends up getting to reset when you're doing the in-circuit test. I've also improved the CIA test. I noticed that initial values of these registers tend to vary from chip to chip. So I improved the test that tracks the time of day. And I also improved the test that checks that the data buses are working. So I have three machines, three broken machines from a video a while back where I said I wanted to work on my in-circuit chip tester. So now that the tester is finally ready, I'm going to try to repair all three of these remaining machines. All right, so what have we here? This is a model 425 Commodore 64. It just happens to be missing the SID and missing the PLA. So the first thing I'm going to do is pop out one of my lovely plaster replacement units because I know this thing will definitely not work without a functioning PLA. I think this machine might have came with a PLA, but I pulled it out because for whatever reason I knew it wasn't working. I think I was testing it with an early version of my chip tester. So I'll plug in the power, plug in the video, and hopefully when I turn it on, nothing explodes. Ew. Okay, that looks really bad. Okay, so it's clearly, ooh. So it's clearly got a problem, even, might even just pull this PLA out of here just so it doesn't do any damage. So obviously something is really bad news here. So before I do anything else, why don't I start with the series of loose chip tests. We've got these CIAs here. They're already socketed. I've already got my CIA test set up here. Pop in the chip. Let's see, passed. Beautiful. Okay, so that's fine. Put that back in. Get the next CIA. Pop that in, lock it down, do a test, and it passes. Okay, so I think these CIAs are fine. Put those back in. All right, now I got some ROM chips. Might as well just pop all these out of here at once. All 
All right, pop in the first ROM chip. You notice one of these legs is a little bent. That's usually not a big deal. Okay, since I'm doing a new test, it's gonna ask me to change the jumpers. Okay, pop down the chip, do a test. Basic ROM, that looks good. Put that back in. This would be the kernel ROM. Testing, that's good. Next, I've got the character ROM. That's fine. So next, because I like to do the CPU test in circuit, let me see if I can make this work. Sometimes when a chip's in a socket, it doesn't make good contact, but let's see what happens. I'll change the CPU test, reconfigure the jumpers. All right, pop the chip on. Give it a test. Okay, already it says pin shorts five. Now it's getting 10 shorts. So it's definitely doing some stepping, but it's not getting where I want it to go. So it's telling me maybe there's some corruption in the data lines. Maybe the memory's no good. Now what I just noticed that I never really saw before is that the position of the chips are a little different on the 425 compared to the 407. These chips are actually moved up. They used to be here and here, now they're here and here. So uh, the last chips I got that are still in sockets are these RAMs. So why don't I take these out of the socket? It's always good to do the socketed chips loose before you do anything else. Okay, so I got those RAM chips out. I'm gonna do the RAM test. This is the 4164 RAM test. Ready to put the chip in, make sure it's the right orientation. Huh, these chips don't even really have a notch on them. I'm actually thinking someone might have put these in upside down. Okay, pop in that RAM. Test, passed. Pop in this RAM chip, test, passed. Great. 41256. Oh my gosh, it looks like the ROM RAM chip. All right, so I am making progress on this repair here. For some reason, when I, I put the PLA in, my new plaster, because there was none in here before, turned the machine off, felt this thing. It was, oh my gosh, it was so hot, burning to the touch. Okay, I've got the PLA and the SID swapped which is not hard to do on Rev425 because they're in the exact opposite positions that they were before. I guess probably the reason they did that, it actually makes sense because now the SID's right next to the output. So it makes sense that it's there because you're gonna get less interference in the audio if there's less uh, travel for the audio signals. That's actually good. So I took the PLA, the plaster, I put it where it's supposed to go. I put all the chips back. I turn the machine on. And I see this. Okay, so because this machine didn't come with a keyboard, I put the lid of a different machine on here because I want to try to troubleshoot the issue just by identifying the patterns in the screen corruption that I'm seeing, because I'm definitely seeing some patterns. And that would actually really help me to deduce exactly what is wrong here, because generally the machine is is functioning. It's it's running programs. Ah, I can see a lot of graphics on the screen, and the graphics is sort of where it's supposed to be but it's a little bit misaligned. So I can change the color. 
I got black, white. So I'm getting the correct color, but notice that it's appearing in two places on the screen. I've got the cursor in two places. So I can clear the screen and set the cursor color. So on the very top, there's nothing. If I go down, what, one, two. Okay, if I go down two rows, it's in the correct place on the left side of the screen and then replicated a little bit upwards. And so that would be how many characters off? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, so 16. So it's where it is and it's also 16 less. If I calculate the location of where the cursor is supposed to be, that's 80. So it's getting 80, 80 minus 16 is 64. So in the place where it's supposed to be reading 64, it's getting 80. So that's telling me that the address bit uh, for the number 16, so that's what, one, two, four, eight, 16. So address, the fifth address bit or address bit four, zero based, is stuck high, at least from the perspective of the video. And so that tells me if I go to the very top of the screen, if I go write 16 characters, I'll probably then see the cursor. All right, perfect. So I know that address pin four is stuck high. So I'm gonna go investigate where and why that's stuck high. So looking at the oscilloscope pattern here, you can see at the top is the AEC line that controls whether the VIC chip or the CPU has access to the RAM. When the top waveform is low, that means that the VIC chip has control. Now on the bottom, what you see is that the signal is not going all the way down, so it's elevated slightly. That's the address pin four. So what's happening is as it goes through the 373 gate, because the signal is a little bit higher than what it considers low, it's just always high. And that's why the pin was held high. Now, going back to the source of the problem, I discovered the source was actually that I fried my plaster. So finally finished this repair. It took a lot longer than it should have. But the good news is that the machine basically works. It just needs a SID. I could temporarily put a SID from another machine in here just to see what happens. But honestly, I'd rather not. SIDs are so delicate and I'd rather not move them around any more than I have to. And besides, I'm really thinking down the road of making my own SID replacement just for fun. So to summarize this repair here, the best advice I would have right now is don't do what I did. Don't ever put a PLA into the slot for the SID because unless it has some serious protection built in to handle that 12 volts, it is gonna basically get fried. So that's about all I have for you today. Thanks for watching and tune in next time to Evie's Review.